Hey folks, welcome to another great interview from The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. This interview was with Lua from the YouTube channel Professor Flower. This interview was recorded and streamed on Twitch on January 19th, 2022. We talk about her channel and some debates she's had with various leftist YouTubers and streamers, as well as concepts that scare white folks like black nationalism and land back. Topics that seem fairly consistently misunderstood by white leftists as well as liberals and conservatives. Before I send you to the interview, I'm going to talk about gas prices and the invasion of Ukraine. But first, I have to thank my new patron, McNutwack. Thank you for supporting the show. <laughs> and of course, a huge thank you to everyone who supports my work. If you would also like to support this project, then... You can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist and sign up for a $1 per month. You can get access to a special patron chat room on the Discord server, as well as extra long videos, occasional early access, and my everlasting thanks. You can also donate uh, one time at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. And if you can't afford that, then share the show around, give it a thumbs up on YouTube or a five star rating and a glowing review on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser. Okay, so I want to start off talking about gas prices because I'm seeing a lot of callousness from people about anyone complaining about them. So I think that first of all, it's vital to recognize who is impacted the most by the price of oil being so high. Obviously, as with all things that reduce our spending power, it is those with the lowest incomes who suffer the most. Some people are saying that the higher gas prices are the price it takes to help the people of Ukraine. And I firmly disagree. The choice to boycott products from Russia or companies still doing business in Russia doesn't seem to have the impact that we want it to. And while Russia does require the income from the sale of oil to maintain the war, I can't see it stopping them anytime soon. And they still have many customers all around the world. I'm also seeing a lot of people who want to absolve Joe Biden and some talking about this meme. So this meme, for those listening, of instead of watching, is two pictures, one above the other, with that guy from the office who was a jerk to the autistic fellow. In the top one, he's pointing to a whiteboard with the words, average price of gas today, March 10th, 2022, is 432 per gallon. Now I'm going to uh, ignore the obvious nonsense that is the American stubbornness over the version of the, their version of the imperial system. The bottom picture is this guy sitting smugly with new words on the whiteboard. They say, the peak daily average price of gas in 2008 for 411 under President Bush adjusted for today's dollar was 586. And of course there's text underneath those pictures that says your link between partisan politics and gas prices is a lie. Now I feel like there's a lot to unpack here, uh, not to get too complicated, but the context certainly matters. The prices under Bush were a result of the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, which was a decision that the president made. So one could say that the president very much did have an impact on, or said to be partially, if not wholly responsible for that increase. Prices went down when the main portion of that conflict slowed and oil production and costs were less hindered. This was all while demand for oil-based products and fuel was rising. The price dropped to lows not seen in years at the start of the pandemic, partly because of the actions of Russia, uh, of Russian leader Putin and members of OPEC who continued and even increased production despite dropping prices and demand. Again, here's leaders of countries making decisions that impact the price of oil. Currently, the price is going up in a response to the sanctions on oil from Russia placed there initially by Joe Biden and then followed by many other nations. The demand for oil staying the same, the demand for oil staying the same while imposed sanctions reduce the supply means that Biden is in fact responsible in part for the current price of oil, including as well as Prime Minister Trudeau and various other leaders. One of the things that trips me up on this is that well-meaning people have memes like this and they use them to dunk on their political opponents. But they don't seem to want to acknowledge that world leaders do make a difference. They don't decide on the price in some way that, in the way that some people imagine. But neither are they wholly innocent. Biden announced the sanctions knowing full well what would happen if he did. But he chose to because he, he values his stance in the conflict with Russia and felt that consumers of the world could bear the weight of this decision. I think it isn't right to put this on consumers. And I think it isn't right that oil companies uh, aren't losing profits. But something like that can't be done just by the president. It has to be a law enacted by the rest of the legislature, and even that wouldn't help everyone, just America. So it's not partisan lies that make Biden responsible for, responsible for the highest gas prices we've seen in over a decade. It's reality. It's his actions, and because of the influence and power of the U.S. state, other countries followed suit. 
which d increased a demand on, diminish on a diminished oil production. I'm not trying to say that he shouldn't have done it, but this desire to dunk on political opponents combined with a media-induced bloodlust that has turned people I normally consider empathetic and wonderful into callous, uncaring monsters who would rather see Russian soldier soldiers die by the thousands than see a peaceful end to the war, and who attack their neighbors for complaining about gas prices, even though the high price of gas means that some of us have to choose between getting to work and buying groceries. There's already been a lot said about the hypocrisy and racism of the media and governments here and in Europe, so I'm not going to talk about that again, but it, it is worth noting whenever they point out how civilized Ukraine is. There are lots of people talking about Russia and Ukraine, and the information is coming too fast, to talk about in a way that I would feel good about. So just be careful when you're looking at this stuff and don't jump to snap judgment. With all that said, I'm gonna send you over to the interview with Lua, AKA Professor Flower. All right, hi and welcome to The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist, the podcast where I talk to a variety of people to spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. And today I'm talking to Professor Flowers of the YouTube channel of the same name. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. So I guess a good place to start is just like a little bit about you and perhaps a little bit about your channel. Sure, yeah. Um, so my YouTube's called Professor Flowers. Um, you can call me Lua. Uh, I make, I like to make video essays that focus on humanizing marginalized people. I normally, uh, or pretty much, I think pretty much every time I've made a video, I analyze media. Um, and I like to talk about things through stories and through the analysis of media because media normally has a narrative. And I, I often find that's very humanizing. Yeah, that's, I, I've, I tend to focus on like trying to debunk things like I, I do a, a segment called counter propaganda where we try to debunk something. And I've found that having a narrative is often way more useful than uh, just reciting facts at people. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. People don't do too well with facts. And I think people are wired to be able to understand stories. So I think even though it's frustrating, I think putting things in a narrative format can help get things across to people easier. Yeah, for sure. Uh, how long ago did you start your channel? Um, I started it maybe a couple years ago, um, but I wasn't really, I just was posting a video here or a video there. And then, or maybe it was around the protest actually that I, maybe a bit, a bit before the protest that things started picking up and I started trying to post more regularly. Oh, okay. Cool. Cool. Yeah. I yeah. just, I recently discovered your channel through, uh, thought slime, uh, I think it was called it uh, was promoting a bunch of different channels on a, like awards show. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so, so uh, and I, I found that I really enjoy your content, but uh, more recently you've had a bunch of videos where you're arguing with other uh, YouTube or streamer leftists. So how did you get mm -hmm. into that? <laughs> oh, well, I was in this group. Uh, and I'm actually trying to make a video just to just to talk about that, just because I oh, okay. think it'll help me move on from the drama that's happened. But yeah, I was just in this uh, group, uh, this online group that uh, where there were some black leftists, and um, I, I used to watch Vosh, which is is it okay if I say the name? Sorry. <laughs> oh, sh sure. Yeah. Uh, no, some I people. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I used to watch Vosh, uh, and I. Um, you know, didn't really see any issues. I didn't watch the, the person religiously, but I, you know, enjoyed some of the content. Thought it was fun watching Nazis get owned debates. And then I joined this Discord, sure. <laughs> um, or I a group. I, I joined a group, and um, yeah, they. I, it just came to my attention that like Vosh was shitting on black leftists, basically, mm. um, and that was like really painful to see. And then I, I kind of just became more aware. Uh, of content that was, you know, specifically attacking black people. And so, uh, you know, I was like, yeah, I don't like Bosch anymore. I felt really disappointed that I had missed a lot of this stuff. And people were like, well, why don't you like Bosch? And then I was like, I'll just make a video to kind of clear the air um, okay. to just kind of um, just be like, this is why this is, you know, the main reason. There's also other reasons, but this is the main reason this person's really racist. And so I made a video on that and that started a back and forth with Vosh and I, um, which led to the drama between us. 
Okay. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that much about Vosh. I've never watched any of his content. Um, but it seems like whenever the name is brought up online, there's a huge back and forth and people are doing like defending him and, and people are uh, calling him out on, out on things. And I guess I've seen a couple clips where I was like, well, I just don't think he's an interesting person. <laughs> so it's, Yeah, that's fair. But uh, I don't I don't enjoy seeing people dogpiled by a bunch of fans of someone either, right? So it seems like that automatically puts me on a, a side in these debates. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I mean, it depends how much you want to get to get into it. But yeah, I mean, I think it's really uh, this person talks about dividing the left a lot, and I think it's actually this person is dividing the left a lot. Like I think. Oh. Um, you know, I don't know. I don't know how much you want to get into that, but um, yeah, as much I just as think you it's want like to. A, I, I don't want to press the <laughs> subject. <laughs> oh, I mean, I'm fine talking about. It. A lot of people are afraid to talk about it because they themselves might get dogpiled if his oh, fans yeah. hear about it. So I think it's pretty stress. It's like just a very stressful thing to talk about. I, Not I'm a really for me. Channel, I'm, like so I, I I'm. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I uh, I don't know. It's. So I guess in a sense, we could almost talk about a broader concept of like uh, left unity. I know there's a lot of people mm -hmm. who are really pro left unity, but often they seem to be like uh, Marxist Leninists or more authoritarian type uh, leftists who think we should all unite under their version of things where, where uh, I know a lot of anarchists are really anti left unity. Uh, so where do you fall on that? Um, I... In general, I uh, don't think that we have to agree on everything. St. Andrewism has a really good video on leftist mm -hmm. unity or leftist, leftist disunity saying that it's not necessarily a problem. Um, I don't think it's I, – I actually don't think it necessarily is. There's things that we're going to disagree on. And also that doesn't mean that we can't work together on a number of issues. And so I think it's – would be good for us to work on those issues together. But I think there's a couple of things that people that are th these massive blind spots. Like one is that uh, on the online left, people aren't focusing colonialism um, at all, pretty much. And right. it's like, especially in Canada and the US, if you're going to talk about anti-capitalism <laughs> and if you're going to talk about anything revolutionary, anything revolutionary at all, you have to talk about colonialism. You have to. You yeah. can't get around it. And we're not going to have anti-capitalism or, revo or revolutions without decolonial decolonization. Um, and so there's like this massive blind spot where it's kind of like I'm seeing, you know, anarchist fight with Marxist Leninist about disagreeing. And what's not even on, on the on the table at all is is colonialism, which is just kind right. of mind boggling to me. Um, I think that's a huge issue. And then also on the topic of uh, leftist unity, I think there are certain things that's like we should work together on, like anti-capitalism, anti-racism, um, you know, you being know. against transphobia, homophobia, and those things. And if we're upholding systems that support these things, then we need to, you know, we need to not do that. We need to call attention to that, which again is – why I've gone to the bother of trying to call out Bosch and debate bros is because these people and what I think and what others think are actually upholding systems of oppression. Right. Um, and that we need to be really critical of that. So I think, yeah, those are kind of my two points about leftist unity. I, I've recently uh, been kind of in it a bit with uh, uh, turfs, turfs, basically. And uh, so, so, but I've had I've feminists talk to me like uh in the sense in the way that like telling me that i shouldn't be having i shouldn't have an opinion on turfism and and uh the debate within feminism on trans rights uh because i'm not a ma I'm a man so i'm not a feminist and i'm curious uh what do you think the outside voices like i, I don't call myself a feminist i say i support feminism right because I understand that men sometimes like that's not an uncontroversial subject and it's not really my place to decide. But I wonder what your take is on somebody from outside of a group having opinions about uh, some of these intergroup uh, type of I, debates, I guess. Mm. Yeah, I, I do want to say I think you can be a feminist and still be a man. Um, 
but I do think like having an opinions on feminism, I think uh, people's opinions need to be informed by the people who are marginalized. So obviously marginalized people don't all agree on everything. Um, right. Marginalized, you know, there's going to be people, uh, there's going to be conflict. Um, but I think like uh, people's opinions who are kind of on the outside group of that should be informed by, should still be informed by marginalized people of that group. So like, if you want to support feminists, you know, I think our opinions should be informed by like, what are feminists saying? What's feminist philosophy saying? And what's the history and context? And why are feminists trying to point this out? Um, so there's like, you know, feminists don't all agree. You have TERFs, right. which are literally a kind of feminist that are just absolutely against trans women. And so, and then you have feminists who are like, that is, you know, a form of anti-feminism because you're excluding all these women. Right. Um, so there's like an example of people not agreeing right there. But for me, like if I was like outside of that argument, I would try to understand um, what are feminists who, um, I try to figure out how, how I can support this fe feminists that are also supporting trans women. What are they saying and how can I support them? Um, I would come from the, at it from that perspective if I was someone on the outside looking in. Yeah, yeah, I think that's fair. I, uh, I try, I have, and I try to do that, but cause everybody's got a different perspective, like you say. So when one side is saying, well, these aren't, you know, the correct feminists to support. And these, uh, this side is saying, well, those feminists are wrong. I, it's hard to, I guess, necessarily weigh, but for myself, I, f I find that whenever somebody's being oppressed more, like if you're adding to the oppression of someone, then that's probably the wrong side, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, we want to end oppression and like feminism that's not intersectional is just uh, bad feminism. Like some of the best, most prominent feminist writers in the past, you know, 100 years or so, you have like Audre Lorde and Bell Hooks. Um, they've been heavily, they've heavily critiqued white feminists for not being intersectional right. and talked about how their feminism's you know, very useless because it only focuses on white women. And I think it's a very, the, the same thing for trans women as well. Um, but uh, yeah, I just think there's like an inability to care about, uh, to humanize these other, these other people. And the best feminist work that I've read actually humanizes everyone um, says, you know, listen, these, these patriarchal structures have been oppressive to all of us, including men, we don't want that anymore. We want to live in a society where we don't have to deal with this oppression for all of us. Right. And the best feminist work is is great at pointing that out. Yeah, that's a good point. It's something that I think online, it's really hard to remember, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I'm dealing with a person. I'm not just dealing with a random bot necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, like there's this like disconnect, disconnectedness that happens. Um yeah, it's a shame because there's also so much talk and spreading of information, but the way that we talk about it is um, is really unproductive, is really abusive. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I uh, I know that, like I just talked to somebody the other day who was talking about how they enjoy trolling right-wingers and they, get, they, they just get a kick out of it. But I can't do that because uh, I get frustrated and then it actually brings out like a cruelty that I don't appreciate in myself. <laughs> So I, I don't even bother doing the trolling thing anymore. Like I used to think it was fun, but I can't do it. Yeah. I know what you mean. Like there's times where I've had, had fun with that, but it's, you know, I think it's ultimately just exhausting and it doesn't really move the conversation forward, which is like, uh, you know, which is just like what we want to see. Um, and it's just not, and then, you know, having to be faced with seeing the conversation not be moved forward, it's kind of makes you feel, it can make you feel hopeless. So I try to, not engage with that. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> probably a good policy, right? <laughs> yeah. So I guess uh, just kind of to go back to your channel a little bit, what are some of the things that you you are planning to cover in the future? Um, there were a number of videos that I wanted to make in the past few months, but I've had um, too much anxiety to be able to make them. So uh -huh. I'm actually going to make a video just talking about that anxiety, um, not to, you know, talk about more drama, but just to try to hopefully have that tell me move on. 
Um, mm. But yeah, I, I wanted to make a video about Squid Game. Um, I thought it was, uh, you know, like a lot, of, like there there is some valid criticism about it's not really, you know, it doesn't actually empower people, but I do like its critique of capitalism. And I like that there was a mainstream critique, critique of capitalism. Um, I wanted to talk about Dave Chappelle, which is like, you know, long since past the right. drama around that. But I, I really wanted to talk about that. Um, and I and I still do. And I also have wanted to make a video on whiteness because it's a concept that a lot of people don't understand. And understanding whiteness is kind of looking at the timeline in, in America. You know, I think whiteness looks different in different countries, but I'm focusing sure. on America and, you know, really like the past hundred years or so and how that's affected how we understand race and why we are today. So there's a lot of things that I've wanted to do, but I haven't really been able to work on them because of just some really intense anxiety that I'm trying to deal with. No, that's, that's fair. It's, uh, it's one of these things like, uh, I, I try to put out one or two of these during my set of days off, uh, but, but it, it just doesn't always work. And, mm-hmm. and I'm not a person who has like, uh, like anxiety or depression or, or, or these, or things that, uh, actually will stop you from producing anything. So <laughs> everybody definitely don't feel any pressure to put out content. Oh, I would, I would definitely <laughs> like to. It's, um, it, it's like, um, yeah, I just, I just, I really can't. I mean, honestly, I, people are going to think I'm selling, sounding melodramatic, but I just have some trauma I have to deal with in order oh, to be able fair. to work on things again. Um, um, but yeah, I would really like to, it's like, I have a lot of joy making videos. Yeah. It's a fun yeah. process sometimes. eh? Yeah, definitely. Um, well, we're, we can switch a little bit to the, uh, counter propaganda if you want. Yeah, sure. So for counter propaganda, you have, uh, topics on land back and this is kind of connected to we mentioned decon de- you mentioned decolonization earlier and uh mm-hmm. or col- colonialism and, and land back really gets the hackles up on a lot of uh white leftists they uh, and yeah. i mean right wingers of course but <laughs> but white leftists uh people that you would almost think sure. should understand, understand the concept better they simply don't yeah. Um, and I just want to be clear when I debated Vosh, I actually wasn't talking about land back. Um, I brought up like a few, uh, a few examples of decolonialism. And um, I was talking about uh, places in Africa. And I, um, I also didn't know I would be debating colonialism that day. Right. Uh, I just said some some stuff off the top of my head. Uh, so I just want to want to preface that. Um, and then an entire conversation about land back sparked. And so on one hand, I'm glad that people were talking about land back. On the other hand, I was very sad that it happened in that way. Um, right. But, but yeah, uh, land back uh, is something that I didn't know was, was controversial among the left. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, I think I do want to try to, to clear up maybe some of the, the misunderstandings around that. Um, I'm not really exactly sure to re- get, begin. Maybe I should just begin with kind of the misunderstandings people have about it. Like a lot of people sure. think that land back is about an ethno state. People think that land back is about um, just indigenous people just wanting to kick white people out or something like that. Um, land back isn't about any of those things. Land back is about giving indigenous people their land back. Um it, it comes down to like the thing that's being talked about is you know respecting the, the treaties that weren't respected uh, and you know having that particular land back, having land that's not being used, uh, having that back. And then what that looks like is indigenous people being able to take care of the land um, and even like co take care of it with the American government. That's something that's being talked about. Um, okay. And yeah, yeah. So it's, um, yeah, it doesn't have to do with like kicking people out. There also might be instances <laughs> people have to reappropriate land, um, but it's not oh, about sure, yeah. uh, a white. Yeah, it's not about white genocide or ethnic cleansing. What it comes down to is having indigenous sovereignty, and this is something that uh, 
I don't think people understand that colonialism is still happening. It's an ongoing thing. People think that it happened a while ago and that it's over. Um, this is, you know, the U.S. and Canada are still colonized places. Colonialism yeah. still ongoing. The, the genocide of indigenous people is still ongoing. And so, um, you know, indigenous people having sovereignty is like finally having control over their land again. Um, finally, uh, you know, being able to do things on their their terms. And there's like a number of examples that I can think of where indigenous people are not able to do that. Um, you know, one thing is like the the government, the the Canadian government, for example, like has to check in, you know, check in with indigenous people, but they check in with the people that the government themselves picked out. Um, and right. then when they check in, even if indigenous people say like, hey, we don't want this, the government can still do it anyways. And then they do. Um, yeah. So like indigenous people still don't have control over their land. Right now, there is a pipeline being installed uh, in Wet'suwet'en land. Um, and yeah. it's legally being installed. And Wet'suwet'en people are fighting this. And and it's it's brutal what the government's doing. It's illegal, first off. But the whole occupation of Canada and the U.S. is illegal. It's um, – yeah it's still it's still wrong and people don't really understand it in that context so we need to give indigenous people their land back and they need to have sovereignty and we need to be you know especially as leftists we need to be standing there with them um in this fight we we and and you know with that all said if we're going to talk about colonialism or not colonialism if we're going to talk about anti-capitalism and we're going to talk about uh you know gender equality and we're going to talk about ending racism. Uh, Land back actually wraps up all these is, you know, covers all of these issues. It's something that as leftists is very exciting because here there is a revolutionary movement happening in the U.S. and Canada. And it's being led by indigenous people. So yep. we need to really follow what they're doing and stand with them as opposed to just being scared and making it about white genocide and ethno states. Yeah, for sure. Like, that's the thing. Like, uh, yeah, I don't know much about the U.S. situation, but in Canada, many of these regions aren't even like, they're not even terror, like treaty territories. They're not, uh, there's no cessation of the land. It, it's totally unceded land. So it still belongs to the original tribes that were there. And Canada just pretends that that's not true. <laughs> Well, they know that they can't, that a lot of in, like indigenous people as communities have a really hard time fighting back because of all of the bureaucracy and legislation. And, you know, a lot of people can't afford lawyers that the state can afford. And they know yeah. that. And so, um, that's, that's how they just continue doing these practices. So, and, you know, same with the U.S. as well. Um, so it's, it's, it's eerie how similar these, these things function in both places. Uh, they're definitely these country. The, the governments are definitely like learning from each other, learning how they can take power away from indigenous people. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. It's. Uh, I just saw something today too that was uh, talking about how for people who live on reserves in Canada, it feels often like be because of the uh, the lack of resources, often the lack of clean drinking water, and just the the lack of support in any way. Uh, it often feels like they're being forced into off of reserves and into uh, like urban centers where those things exist. And then uh, and then the government will just reclaim whatever, you know, land isn't being used. And so, and so in a sense, like just by not giving them what they need to survive or or helping them have what they need to survive, they are eliminating their ownership of their lands. Yeah, that's exactly it. And the government's systematically doing that. This yeah. is kind of what people mean. <laughs> well, this is exactly what people mean when they talk about the ongoing genocide right. and how it's it's still happening. Um, people are put in really awful conditions and then they end up having to move or people have to sell their land because they're in, uh, you know, they're backed into a corner and the government reclaims that or not reclaims, uh, takes that land and... Um, yeah. That's that's a part of the ongoing genocide, like the lack of resources sent to indigenous people during, you know, this pandemic. Um, all of these things, like they're not um, they're not done on accident. It happens because the government sees these people as a problem, and does 
it, you know, is trying to bide their time, hoping that these people will, you know, die off and not it have less and less power as time continues. Right. Or they'll assimilate by just moving into urban centers and, you know, take ign- learning, learning, uh, forgetting their languages and forgetting about their ties to the land. And, mm-hmm. and yeah, yeah, just whatever it takes to make them not a problem to the powers that be. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I, uh, I was I, there. Are, I live in Saskatchewan. So there's uh, a few months ago, we had, there was a mining company that went on to indigenous land to do some surveying because they want to do some mining. And there was some protests. Uh, the, the local tribes there in that region, they said, Hey, this isn't cool. We don't want to do this. But, but and that whole idea where like you have to, uh, what is it? You have to refer to them or you have to talk to the, the, the tribes first, but legally it's not binding in any way. So, so then, then you can say, oh yeah, they don't want it, but it's economically viable or it's economically beneficial to the region. So we're going to do it regardless. And it, it often, often the indigenous tribes are taking into account more than just the economics. They're taking into account like the, uh, the, uh, environmental impacts, uh, the impacts on the drinking water, like all this stuff that could impact the people around it. And yeah, the government just chooses to, for dollars and cents wise, <laughs> they, they ignore whatever they want. Yeah. Um, and it's actually reminded me of something that we're reading in a book called The Red Deal. Um, there was this, I don't remember exactly what it said, but it was talking about how um, we're losing like we've lost, like when we like develop this land, uh, you know, you know, the example that comes to mind, um, is like places like Mount Rushmore where, you know, these, the faces of the presidents were carved in. Right. Um, and when we do things like that, that's lost forever. And something that was really interesting about, um, the red deal is that it talked about how, how like we've, we, we, the language that people have been using is that, uh, you know, indigenous people have lost this, which is true. The indigenous people have lost it, have lost this. But the language that the Red Deal uses is that we've lost this. And um, mm-hmm. it's something that just really shifted things to think of it as us as humans have lost, have lost these places forever. Um, these places that took billions of years to just uh, form and they're yeah. gone forever. Um but I think there's like this sense of of that where a lot of indigenous people fighting for their home, uh, I think they have this understanding about how it's all of our home and we're just destroying it. And it's it's not something to be developed for for profit. Yeah. Um it's something that needs to be taken care of. Uh, there's a heavy focus on that. Um yeah. and yeah, I think I think that's a really when I think about that, I think like that's a world that I want to be in. I want to live in a world where I want to take care of it. I don't want to live in a world where I just want to exploit it. Uh, even that itself, there's there's a lot of practical reasons not to exploit the earth because right. look at hap- what's happening with climate change, because what's happening with capitalism and uh, you know just the oppression and that 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 gives all of us. But then just just wanting to take care of the world, I think, is just um, the kind of world that I want to live in. And I think that that's also a focus of theirs that I really appreciate. That's something that I, I really like about, uh, it's kind of, uh, separate from the indigenous, uh, well, maybe it's not <laughs> the conversation that we just were having, but it's like, uh, I just recently, uh, I guess by recently a few months learned about solar punk and that seems like that kind of mentality, like that we're taking care of the earth and we're trying to, you know, you know, we, we use it and feed back into it in a very like mm-hmm. balanced way. And I, my, I, I, I find it really cool. <laughs> I don't know that much about it yet, but. <laughs> yeah, I'm really glad that you brought that up because I really love solar punk. Um, I found it during a time where like I, I felt really hopeless and I can honestly like lean towards being a doomer and feeling really depressed and like, oh, things are awful. And then I, you know, found out about solar punk and was just like, wow, like what a really great way to envision the future. I felt right. so excited and so ecstatic. And uh, that is how I feel about Land Back. 
I feel hopeful. I feel like there's something happening right now. And um, it's gaining, I've noticed that it's gaining a lot more grounds in Canada. Um, and so I live, I live in the US, but um, I'm really hoping that that both movements will like just flourish, uh, you know, in the Canada and in the US. And it For makes sure. me really excited. And I, if there's a way, I, I would really like to help share that excitement with people where there's, um, because I think when we're talking about uh, anti-capitalism, there's a way where it's like, it doesn't really, well, especially it doesn't, you know, people can be very, you know, like leave out the issues of racism. Um, but right. the way that that land back just is like talking about like, you know, gender equality, like the way that people are very sexist and homophobic and transphobic. These are not things that, you know, indigenous cultures struggled with. Um, they might, you know, haven't had like a word for word for LGBTQ plus, but, it, you know, these societies were not against the, you know, ideas of being gay or being trans. And same as with a lot of um, the African uh, slaves that came, you know, this is something like a lot of white people don't understand that homophobia and sexism is is a product of white supremacy. That's something that we learned because it came um, from from these white cultures. Not to say this is the only culture that has had these issues. I haven't studied the world enough to really understand that it's true. But I do know that uh, indigenous people and black people, you know, African people didn't have these issues until colonialism and slavery. Right. Um, right. And so talking about decolonialism, you know, the people who are talking about land back really get that. And so like people who are supporting land back are very much about gender equality, um, about being against, against homophobia, about being against uh, transphobia. And it's really exciting. It's really exciting to see all these things tie and connect that, you know, obviously racism, that's kind of a no brainer of like why right. that's messing us up. Um, but then also like, the issues of capitalism, like capitalism is is what's oppressing us and it's what's oppressing the land and it's oppressing the rest of the creatures and the other biotic environments that we're all, you know, intertwined with. And so land back is also, you know, environmentalist and anti anti-capitalist. So it's it's very just all these things that you have, like all these indigenous people writing about this. And yeah, it's just really exciting. It's like, uh yeah, it's just something that I really hope takes off on the left and that uh, we can all support. I uh, Forgive me if this is too far afield, uh, but I kind I, I my roots are kind of in the skeptical and science movement before it divided between SJWs and non SJWs and whatever. But uh, so I kind of still always have this idea about uh, the religious uh, stuff that came with colonialism. Uh, uh, like a lot of regions didn't have Christianity and a lot of the baggage that seems to come with that. And then colonized colonizers brought that over and then tried to force people into their religious boxes. And then uh, I wonder if some of the, the homophobia, the misogyny, like some of this stuff, I mean, yes, capitalism, colonialism, but also Catholicism in, in many ways. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly it. It's it's honestly like it's been a form of colonialism, like trying to get people to follow, uh, you know, the Christian religion is like one of the first way that you help pacify people. Um, right. And we've just seen that like around around the world. Um, I think something that I've become aware of is like, uh, well, you know, most of the world has been colonized um, and yeah. People, you know, countries are either living in the aftermath of colonialism and overthrowing their colonialist powers or are still colonized. Um, and uh, I, I think people aren't really aware of that. I think that's part of why Christian Christianity is so huge. You know, not to say that if you not to say that they're, you know, I think people can practice Christianity in a way that's perfectly fine. But, sure. uh, you know, recognizing it as a colonial power is, is really important. But, yeah, I... Uh, I myself was really um, was really just surprised because I had grown up Christian. I had grown up learning that, um, you know, that like we need to spread the word of God and all of that. And I remember reading these books about um, reading these books about these missionaries. I forgot what group of people they went to, but I remember these 
they went to this group of people and they were like, hey, like we we want to bring you the word of God uh, because, you know, we need to save you. And they were like, save us from what? We're doing fine. And I remember reading <laughs> right. that and just being like, just shocked because I was Christian and I was like, people are doing fine without Jesus, without having to have this religion pushed on them. And I just came to find out that, you know, I can't speak for every religion or every group of indigenous people. It's just, it was very unsettling to read about so many groups of indigenous people, you know, whether they're from the Americas, whether they were from Africa, and just learning about how they didn't have issues with sexism. They, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't mean there weren't gender roles, but right. um, it, there was also more freedom to choose, to choose things. And then because it just seemed like they were more communicative with each other. Like, do you want to be doing this? It was okay if you didn't want to be doing this. There was still something for you. It was okay if you didn't fit these gender norms. There's, you know, something created for you to still exist if you don't quite fit this this binary. Like, a lot of places, people didn't have binary gender in the way that we have it in the West. And that was from colonialism. And it's um, just been un- unsettling. It's, it's uh, you know... And I can't, again, I can't speak for every indigenous group of people, but just from when I looked, looked into, I would like look group after group and just be reading about them trying to like, even, you know, this might seem like a little bit off topic, but like even the word rape, um, my, I remember like one of my teachers like said that, you know, indigenous people had raped a bunch of people. And I was like, you want to fact check that? Cause I'm pretty sure that's not true. Um, right. And we like, he actually like looked it up in a, in a database, looked up scholarly work and was like, yeah, you're right. Like in the Americas at the very least, a lot of, there were a lot of indigenous people that didn't even have the word for rape because it wasn't a thing. Uh, when people did kidnap colonizers, for example, you know, because these colonizers were like, oh no, like they've kidnapped our women, they're going to rape them. And actually like these people, there'd be people who like, I don't want to go back because I'm really happy here. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there wasn't any, like, sexual violence or anything because these cultures just didn't have it. Um, and, I, again, I can't speak for every single indigenous culture, but from what I looked at, that was not a thing. And so, like, there's all these assumptions of, like, oh, well, you know, humans, they're just racist naturally. Humans are just naturally sexist. Humans are going to, you know, rape people, da 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 And it's like, no, this is very much a facet of, like, these specific imperialist cultures. You know, like, right. when you look at cultures who have, like, try to dominate the world and dominate other people, you see stuff like that. But there's a lot of groups of people who did not do that. And, yeah. you know, every indigenous group, person, group that I've looked into, uh, you know, hasn't necessarily had these issues. Doesn't mean that that's all of them, but I think that speaks a lot. Um, I, I don't really remember. Sorry, I don't remember where I was going with that. Um, no, that, that sounds... But I just like, thought that was very telling. telling. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It sounds a lot like... Uh, like I just, uh, I'm still in the midst of reading David Graeber, the new David Graeber book. And there's a, a kind of a chapter where they kind of talk about some of that stuff where like uh, a lot of the problems that imperialist dominating cultures brought with them, like were bizarre to the indigenous peoples when they were being colonized. They're like, what is all this stuff you're talking about? Like, this doesn't make any sense. So yeah. But it, it also like the idea of like uh, the the victimization of uh, uh, white women it, it is very much a thing that uh, has been used by dominating like colonialist cultures to vilify those that are, you know, that they're colonizing. Yeah. And it's really frustrating because they'll talk about like they'll, there's this worry that like the savage is going to, you know, like come after right. women. And, you know, this has also been put on black people as well. Yeah. And literally, uh, white people, ha- like, sorry, I don't, I don't want to get your video demonetized, but, like, white yeah. white people have been coming after, um, like, like literally, like, I I was, like, so I'm, I was, I'm adopted and I was, like, trying to find, like, my biological parents. And uh, when I went on an- Ancestry.com, I found out that my great-great-great-grandmother uh, was born out of rape out of slave rape okay. and it's just like white people white like people. white co- you know colonizers were talking about this fear of these savages coming after their women and they're the ones genociding and raping everyone yeah. so it's it's just yeah. like kind of frustrating to me i'm just like 
it, it, anyways. Nope, that um, is a fair frustration. It's, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if there's anything I can add to it, <laughs> the conversation for that. But, but yeah, it's, it is frustrating. Even, even if a person isn't invested in it, uh, just as a matter of truth, caring about just facts, like it's not true or it is more true that white people have been a danger to other groups than other groups have been a danger to white people. <laughs> it's just the way it is. <laughs> So. Yeah, and I don't. I don't think people understand that. Like, I think, uh, just going back to the debate that I had with Vosh, where like I'm just trying to talk about decolonization, and Vosh is talking about white genocide. It's like I don't think right. people understand that bringing that up as if that's a legitimate fear when, you know, colonized yeah. and indigenous people uh, just want, like, especially like when I look at the historical examples of. Uh, colonization like people aren't ever seeking revenge they actually are just trying to end colonialism and once it's done uh you know they try to prevent it but they don't they don't you know they're not trying to create a system where you know white people are aren't enslaved or the tables are turned they're just trying to end colonialism and it's not you know historically we can look at these patterns and you know i don't think there's like there's not really anything to be worried about in that regard of, no. of colonizing people doing what they've done, uh, what white people have done to them. Yeah, exactly. Especially, especially when, especially when colonized people are saying that they're like, listen, you know, with land back, they're like, we just want our <laughs> land back. You know, you can believe them. You, you don't have to distrust them. I, I think people genuinely do. I don't think there's like some secret cabal of indigenous people trying to come after yeah, white people. I, I think that uh, that's an, again, it's a projection, right? Like, because colonizers, will have in the past said stuff like, oh, we just want to make this deal or we just want to do this. And then they would lie and backstab and steal the land or, you know, or, or commit genocide. But, you know, so it's projection again, just like all the, all the fears generally. Yeah. I guess we can go on to kind of the foes and comrades. For foes, you have debra- debate bros suck. <laughs> and we've kind of mentioned Vosh a couple times, uh, but you also did a video on uh, Xanderol or is that right? Mm-hmm. Xanderol? Yeah. Yeah. Who's another person that I've never watched. So I, <laughs> I've had a, I'm kind of clueless as to some of this stuff, but. Yeah. I mean, I think that's kind of good. I don't, I don't think they're, um, I didn't know who Xander Hall was until he responded to one of my videos and then his response was just really rude. And so I responded to his video. Like, so he made a, like he made a, people were talking like, should we focus on debating or focus on converting Nazis to the left? And I just made a video being like, listen, like if you, you can do that personally, but I also think like as a group of people, it's not a great use of our time as a group because then we're just like converting people over who like kind of hate us. And then they kind of bring in a lot of issues because they were Nazis like two days ago. Right. So it's like, I think it's a very uh, noble task. Cause I know some people really like people who, especially who were ex Nazis, like will be a part of programs to help de-radicalize people. And I think that's really great. I'm not yeah. trying to say to stop doing that, but I'm saying like, especially for the online left, it's not the way that it's happening. Isn't that productive? It's kind of creating an, a whole entire other issue. Right. Um, and I think we can, you know, better spend our time trying to focus on like the masses of people. Like there's like a lot of people that we can help, you know, kind of radicalize to the left who are like, you know, there's like lots of people, people getting evicted from their homes. There's a pandemic right now. You know, we should really <laughs> be speaking to the people and being like, hey, uh, the government's failing us. It's failing all of us. And we're trying to make a movement where we're going to, you know, establish a society where like we're not we're not going to just be left to die just because you don't make enough money. And yeah. I think a lot of people really appreciate that. And I want to, I don't think we should be trying to speak to those people. So that's what my video was about. And then he responded and was just kind of like a dick about it. And I was like, yeah, fuck you. And, uh, <laughs> Fair. yeah, I mean, I, I just pretty much tried to debunk his, his stuff. I didn't, you know, I didn't try to be, um, you know, I didn't try to be like, uh, you know, stoking the flames, but I was just like, this is why I think your response is wrong. Um, so that was my Xander Hall experience. Fair. I, uh, I see a lot of like 
in the broader sense, I see a lot of people debating, you know, various things. Uh, right now, one of one of uh, somebody I really respect is debating uh, gender critical feminists, and through uh, some other format, I think it's like the letter writing wiki or whatever it is, and uh, and I really respect him. But that's I don't know that that's where I would put my energies. I I think I agree with you where like, like people, people are getting evicted, so maybe we should put out information about how to uh, develop tenants unions and stuff like that. Like I don't I just I don't always think it's worth fighting against bad ideas in that when we could be building a movement and then radicalizing people that way. But I mean, maybe yeah, I'm I wrong think too, the way. <laughs> I mean, I really think the way that we can use the, like, I think the online, uh, being online has its limits. Um, but I think it's a really great way to disseminate information. And so I would just like to see people be focused on how to disseminate information about, about leftism, about, you know, how to empower people. Um, I think that would be like a great way to use, use this tool. Um, people want to use it for other things. I think, that's also fine as long as it's not hurting anyone because not everyone's mm. up for doing that. And I want to respect that. But I think also with debate bros, it's like, it's way past like, well, uh, you know, do what you want to do at this point. I think they're causing a lot of, um, um, I think they're pushing the online left farther to the right. Um, right. Which I think is that itself is a want. huge problem. <laughs> yeah. It's just something that I think that we do need to address. I'm not sure how much, to address it because I've talked about it quite a bit and I, there's other things I want to move on to. Um, For sure. But I do think it needs to be talked about um, because I do think it's, it's not just do what you want at this point. I think it is a problem. I'm always interested. I'm curious, like what, like, okay. So I want to leave room for people who used to have terrible ideas to grow and learn and, and join us on the correct side of uh, moving society in a good direction. But also I'm, I'm always worried like, uh, that they're not actually changing the way they look at the world, that they're just changing one leader for another, right? If, if you're trading your online Nazi leader for Vosh, who says the right things, but doesn't act in those, like, but still acts in a reactionary way, way like, like, is that better? Or are you just doing the same thing you were doing before? Um, yeah. And I want to say like, there are things that I don't really think he says the right things. Like, I think this is like kind of the issue. That's fair. Like he says things, um, like he'll talk about like really sensitive racist topics to like try mm. to, um, make a point in a debate. And then that information pretty much gets misunderstood by his audience. So like, there's like an issue around like him bringing up Jews controlling the banks, um, I don't think he actually like is a Nazi. It's just like when he brings this up, you know, people get really confused about like, oh, this is a Nazi talking point, but you're saying that, you know, a lot of Jewish people did control these banks. And then, you know, people just get confused. You know, he'll say stuff like, well, black and black crime is a thing. And so it's like, it's really confusing because it's like, uh, like what, just like what, like, you know, he, he kind of brings these things up in a really careless way. Right. And then his audience, you know, he has almost 400 K followers gets, they get really confused about some pretty important topics, you know, whether he's actually a Nazi or not. I, I don't really think he actually is. I just think he handles these things in a way that's really harmful. Um, but I think, but yeah, I do think there's, it, it comes down to, you know, people, people wanting to feel like, they're right. And so they can kind of have this backing of this very confident person, um, as opposed to like looking at the world and being like, what do we need to support each other and um, right. get through this pandemic? What do we need to do to, to try to bring about some change so we can stop living under all this systemic oppression? Like th those aren't, that's not really on the focus of people's minds. I think people uh, are kind of like vicariously living through this person and, you know, that's kind of like what we're talking about, parasocial relationships where people um, people feel confident because they are kind of like vicarious living through this other person's confidence. And right. that's an issue when that person is confidently, you know, uh, you know, 
kind of just taking a dump on marginalized people, for example. For sure. Um, uh, well, we're coming up pretty close to the hour. I guess uh, for for comrades, is there anybody you want to give a shout out to about uh, how good a job they're doing or whatnot? Yeah, um, there are a number of um, black content creators that I've uh, uh, found about that I think are really great. Uh, there's Tiana, um, Foreign Man in a Foreign Land. He's really funny. Um, FD Signifier. A lot of people might already know about him. Um, if you want to watch some uh, Black Anarchist, there's um, Overthrow Media, um, Ronan Youngblood, um, and also St. Andrewism as well. And, and yeah, yeah. Um, those are some those are some people. I'm I know I always kind of. Kind of as soon as I'm done, I'm going to like think of some other people and be like, dang it. I wish I had said them. Of course. <laughs> um, yeah. But those are some people. No, oh, it sounds good. And I guess where can people find you? Yeah. You can find me on YouTube at Professor Flowers or on Twitter. You can find me at Lua Borealis. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time. Yeah. Nice thanks for having me on. You bet. Yeah. You as well. That's all, folks. Thanks for watching or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends or on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. It's really appreciated, and it helps me spend more time on this and my other projects. If you want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a five-star rating or a and a review on the podcast app of your choice or on one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser or RateMyPodcast.com would be great. If you want to find more from me, make sure to check out the show notes or check out my link tree. That's linktr.ee slash skeptical court. You can find all my social media stuff there as well as links to my other show, From Many People's Strength, which is a podcast about Saskatchewan politics, and a project I'm involved in with my friend Damien Marie at Hope that's called Atheist Humanist Leftist Revolutionaries. My Twitter is at Skeptical Lefty, and my Facebook page is The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. You can email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. And if you want to be a guest on the show or know someone I should reach out to, then feel free to let me know. You can book interviews in my available time slots on my Calendly, which is also found in my link tree. Thanks so much for listening, and let's try to make sure we're applying critical thinking and reasoned skepticism when we're attacking the system. If we get caught up in bad thinking, we can derail ourselves. <laughs>